So today, though, we're talking about the Opic Book of Enoch, um, and this is just sometimes called the Book of Enoch. Uh, it's sometimes called the first book of Enoch uh, because there's actually bunches of books of Enoch and we have to differentiate. And so essentially this is the oldest and most important of the books of Enoch. It's not that the books of Enoch are all written by Enoch necessarily, and there's what, Enoch, first Enoch, second, third, and fourth Enoch like we have, and they're just all part of a set. They're coming from very different authors, uh, but they're just numbered later. Chapter one, the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when the wicked and godless are to be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man, whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them. The Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling, and the Eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and appear from his camp, and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens. And all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers shall quake, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth and the high mountains shall be shaken, and the high hills shall be made low, and shall melt like wax before the flame, and the earth shall be wholly rent in sunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish, and there shall be judgment upon all men. But with the righteous he will make peace, and will protect the elect, and mercy shall be upon them, and they shall all belong to God and they shall all be prospered, and they shall all be blessed, and he will help them all, and light shall appear unto them, and he will make peace with them. And behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, and to destroy all the ungodly, and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Okay, so we'll talk, just to even talk about this particular book, we want to have a little bit of background context about the Bible and about uh, the canon. And so uh, here we're going to be talking about, when we're talking about Enoch, we're talking about Old Testament, or uh, for the, what Christians call the Old Testament, uh, also the Hebrew Bible for uh, Judaism. Although it's published, you know, kind of as a single book, in fact, uh, the Old Testament is made up of multiple books that were not all written at the same time or place or anything like that, and they all kind of came together to be by edited. Anyway, they're all put together and now published together. But, um, you know, in addition to those ones that made it in, there were many, many more texts that are sort of Bible-like or also uh, sound, you know, maybe sound like the Bible and also are quite ancient and are written uh, in many cases in Hebrew or Aramaic or maybe in Greek uh, that are not included in the Bible, that didn't make it in. So why did some make it in and some not make it in? So if we look at um, how the canon emerged in Judaism, in rabbinic Judaism, so a after the destruction of the Second Temple, uh, as the rabbis are meeting together and deciding what the canon is going to be, uh, they come up with um, three groupings of writings that get uh, included. And so there's an acronym that's Tanakh here that's being made from Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. I don't speak Hebrew, so I'm pronouncing this very badly. But essentially, law, prophets, and writings uh, is how these go. And that's also how they're organized. So essentially, the Torah, uh, the most important in the, in the Christian, Christians that call this the Pentateuch or the five books attributed to Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, then the, the prophets, are the, essentially the, from Joshua, well in this case they, they're grouped differently than how Christians group them, right? So Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, 
Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12 minor prophets that are all grouped together, so everybody like Jonah and everybody all in one book. And then finally the writings, which are things like Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon, etc., down to Chronicles, right? Okay, so that's that. Uh, and it's probably, it's not clear when this canon is done. Um, there may well have been, very early on, um, some uh, Jews who kind of are keeping to this much more constrained canon, uh, and they are actually even maybe knocking some of these books out even. So there might have even been more restrictions, so a lot of them might have been, there was arguments, for example, that Song of Solomon, you know, which is, doesn't mention God and is really an erotic love poem, maybe this shouldn't make it in, right? <laughs> you know, and so, and so that's even true among um, the rabbis as they're still arguing that. But it's maybe fixed um, by the early second century um, rabbinic councils. Meanwhile, before that, uh, in the third century BC then, so hundreds of years before that, there had been this very important translation of all of the texts uh, occurring in the Hellenistic kingdom of Egypt in Alexandria, so the site of the, the great library, so this uh, Greek repository of all learning is the goal, and so uh, Tal King Ptolemy, all the kings are called Ptolemy, you know, is, according to the uh, legendary account, um, you know, agrees that the, the, the Bible of the, the law of the, uh, of the Jews is ancient enough and important enough that it also needs to be uh, housed in the Library of Alexandria, but of course it has to be translated into Greek in order to make it be worth anything in there as far as they, and so they get together together, um, you know, 70, actually probably 72 according to the tradition, the magic number is probably 72, but anyway, 70 uh, scholars who um, are able to kind of, according to the tradition anyway, under inspiration, uh, translate the book, you know, kind of perfectly under divine guidance. They're Jewish uh, scholars who are learned in the text. Uh, there is a massive Jewish uh, community in Egypt, uh, and there's been Jews, there were Jews in Egypt very early on, I mean obviously in, according to the traditional story, uh, everybody came out of Egypt, right? But they also went back at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, we think of the Babylonian captivity, so when the exiles all go to Babylon, but an equal number of people also flee to Egypt, uh, and they have a community there. And so, for example, the prophet Jeremiah, uh, who is a prophet that is existing before the destruction of Jerusalem, he also then goes into exile in Egypt, where he's among the, the Egyptian community. Uh, they, and even in the Jewish-Egyptian community, even at a certain point, um, builds its own temple there in Egypt, and which is not the understanding later that later Jews have that you can have temples outside of Jerusalem, but it is what the Egyptians are doing. Anyway, and so when uh, Egypt becomes conquered by Alexander the Great, it becomes a Greek center. Uh, the capital, this great city of Alexandria named that Alexander founds, uh, there ends up being a massive Jewish community there, and it may well be more than, there's certainly more than maybe are living in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a smaller city. So the Septuagint, uh, according to its own traditions, or it's the traditions that are early or surrounding it, it is also then inspired. And so for Greek-speaking Jews and also Greek-speaking Christians, um, the text is itself you know, often ha has the same kind of scriptural weight as the original would have been in Hebrew. You can see here that there is way fewer books in the, in the Hebrew Bible than in the Septuagint, right? And they're also grouped differently. So um, there's more books that are making it in. So the law is the same, so the Torah is the same, the Pentateuch here is the same, the five books of Moses. But then uh, we have a different grouping here. Instead of uh, the prophets, at first here we have history <laughs> grouping. And so it's essentially the readers here of the Septuagint are more or less saying that um, Joshua is not speaking the same way as a prophet Isaiah is speaking. This is too and then these include a bunch of books that aren't in the Jewish scripture. So that's Tobit, Judith, uh, Maccabees, you know, four books of Maccabees. And then in the wisdom section, so the wisdom section here is things like Psalms and Job and Proverbs and Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. But it also includes books like Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus or Sirach, uh, the Psalm of Solomon. Uh, and then finally, then the prophets, people, the prophets like Isaiah are grouped here at the end of that. So I was suggesting that this canon, so a lot of these books, these books were already written long before, they're, where, before the canon is finalized, right? So the last of the books to be written is like the book of Daniel. 
And so that's going to be I, uh, during the Maccabee Revolt. And it makes it in because um, it pretends to be written much earlier than it is. right? And so because it, it's meant to be written at the time of the Babylonian captivity, and it's talking about that, um, and, and the council kind of believed that, uh, it makes it in when much, much earlier books didn't make it in. Uh, but then the canon is maybe formulated in the second century AD. So when um, Christianity then uh, emerges in the first century AD, or the first century of the Christian era, um, Christians are writing their own uh, uh, texts, which ultimately become Christian scripture, are ultimately incorporated into the Christian part of the Bible, the New Testament. Uh, when the Christians are writing uh, that text, um, they now, that text, we should point out, is written in Greek. <laughs> so that text, even though uh, the, the first Christians, even though Jesus uh, is Jewish and all of his disciples, immediate disciples, are all Jewish, and their na native language would have been Aramaic, uh, which is a, essentially a, um, an ancient Syrian. And so it's related, very closely related to um, Hebrew. Uh, but anyway, Hebrew would have been their liturgical language, so they read scriptures in Hebrew, but the language that they would be speaking every day is Arabic. Anyway, so when the, no, we, none of the early Christians, though, none of those people, Jesus doesn't leave any writings at all, so Jesus never wrote a book and talk, talked about this is my gospel, this is my message, or anything like that. And none of the early disciples wrote um, their message in, in Aramaic. Instead, when Christians got to writing, they were writing in Greek. And when um, they have, for example, there's many places in, let's say, the Gospels, uh, where they have Jesus uh, quoting then from the Hebrew Bible, they aren't having him the way he would have actually talked. He would have spoken in Aramaic, and then he would have said something in Hebrew, and then you would imagine that the translator who is writing uh, the Gospel down, who's writing it into Greek, would then both translate, let's say, both the Aramaic and translate the, the, the Hebrew that Jesus is saying. Instead, the, the gospel writers are writing their own Greek story, and when they quote out of the Hebrew Bible, they quote from the Septuagint, right? So this is not a, a, a new translation of the text. They are using the Septuagint as the, um, as the version of the Bible. So it's all very important then for the early Christians. So, um, the Septuagint then is the basis uh, for the Christian Old Testament. So when uh, Christians started, uh, Christianity, um, some Christians, some early Christians, uh, felt that the Old Testament was completely unnecessary. And so, in fact, there's an early uh, attempt, the earliest attempt in Christianity uh, of making a canon was a kind of a radical uh, guy named Marcion who, uh, in the early second century, who made a list where he absolutely excluded almost all the books of the New Testament that we think of as the Christian Bible, and he also uh, said that the Old Testament is absolutely worthless. <laughs> and so he had a very extreme position that pretty much everybody reacted against, right, in the early Christianity. So, um, anyway then, though, this, because like I say, this set of books in this order that is what the Christians then, the Christians who are primarily spread through the Greek-speaking world of the Roman Empire, Greek is spoken as a, as a second language even in the western part of the empire, um, that becomes their scripture. And so uh, even when, um, uh, when it's being translated into Latin in the fourth century, uh, after it's become the state religion of the Roman Empire, and so now they need to have a good, good uh, Latin version uh, from the, for the westerners who don't speak Greek, uh, the Vulgate uh, of St. Jerome takes, he uses the same books in the same order that the Septuagint has, even though he himself goes back to the Hebrew in order to make some of his translation. Uh, Augustine, this is one of the things where St. Augustine, who's another contemporary leader in the West, uh, doesn't think is necessary because he says, we, the Septuagint is already perfectly translated because that was under inspiration. So you can just take it from the Greek and translate it directly into Latin. Uh, but Jerome went back to the Hebrew to do it. But the organization and the number of books are taken from the Septuagint. So it is only, if you can imagine, in the fifth century then that the Christian canon becomes fixed. Uh, meanwhile, that's at the simultaneously, uh, the rabbinic uh, schools have started rejecting the Septuagint. So they, 
don't, um, in part because of the Christians have kind of run away with it and have made it their own, uh, and also because uh, uh, the rabbis have maybe decided that Hellenism uh, has all of these bad connotations and leads you bad ways. Uh, there's an emphasis on going back to the Hebrew texts. And so uh, the Septuagint and, it, and its number of books are, are discarded uh, when creating the rabbinic canon. And so when the Reformation occurs 500 years ago in the uh, Christian West, so when the Protestants uh, break away from Rome, they are also then going back to the originals. And so they are also going back and translating, they, and they also there are Jews around, and so they're able to look at the Jewish texts <laughs> And they say, wait, we have all these books in our Bible that you don't have in your Bible, and Judaism is older than Christianity, so maybe these books shouldn't have been added in. And so then the Protestants take them all out, all the ones that are, are in that the Jews don't have, right? And so this is exactly uh, what Protestants call the Apocrypha. And so these books are <coughs> Tobit, Judith, uh, the book of Esther that has extra bits on it, uh, Wisdom of Solomon, the book of Sirach. Uh, the book of Baruch, which is, is kind of like the add-ons to the book of Jeremiah. The extra bits of the book of Daniel. Uh, and so this is books like the, um, uh, the idol bell and the dragon. And so if you've, ever, if, you've ever know, if you've read this and you've read the book of Daniel and you have a story where um, the king of Babylon uh, is having this idol and he, um, every day they, uh, they bring a feast to it and every night they close it up. And, uh, and then, they, then they wake up in the morning and the whole feast and all the wine and everything's all gone. And that's proving that the idol uh, consuming this God is really God because he's consuming all of this feast and, uh, and, and the wine anyway. And so then Daniel is able to show the, the king that all the priests of this particular pagan God are going in there and having a big feast every night and they're getting all this free food and everything. And, that, uh, and so then anyway, once it, once it becomes shown, then, then uh, uh, the king smashes all, smashes the idol and kills all the priests and you know anyway so that's one of the fun stories that is in the Apocrypha but not in the regular book of Daniel right <laughs> and then the books of Maccabees so this is the kind of history in the intertestament period so uh, of when essentially the Jewish revolt against the uh, the Greek um, Syrian you know kings of Syria okay and so then that leaves this kind of weird peculiar divide in the canons right <laughs> So rabbinic Judaism and Protestant Christianity have share a Bible text list where it doesn't include the Apocrypha, whereas the Orthodox Christians and Catholics uh, share a Bible that does include the deuterocanonical texts, which are both the same texts, right? However, okay, so even though today rabbinic Judaism doesn't use these texts as part of scripture, uh, many in the first century, many first century Jews Hellenistic Jews especially, so in other words, Greek-speaking Jews who were in the diaspora, so there were Jewish uh, communities all throughout the Roman Empire, especially in the Greek-speaking East. Um, many of them didn't know Hebrew, and for them the Septuagint is their um, scripture, and that included then these deuterocanonical books. Um, and however, and I would also point out here that even in the Aramaic-speaking parts of, the, of Judea, some of these Jews considered the text to be canon. Obviously, early Christians who were Jews thought of these texts as being part of the canon, as did, um, for example, three of these that are, have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so uh, the group of, um, uh, one of the Jewish groups, the Essenes, um, were ascetics who had a kind of a monastic community, an apocalyptic community, a priestly community, uh, where they were waiting kind of for the end times, and they were, it's on the shores or near the Dead Sea, uh, and they had all kinds of texts, and at a certain point they buried all of the texts, and then their, their sect, fortunately they buried, everybody should be going, in, in, in antiquity, if everybody would have just gone and buried all their texts in the <laughs> desert, <laughs> it would be wonderful, but anyway, uh, anyway, fortunately they did, and, and so as a result of that, um, we've recovered um, very, very ancient manuscripts indeed, uh, of the Bible, but also extra biblical material, including in this case bits of the books of Tobit, Sirach, and the Epistle of Jeremiah, which is to say portions of then the Apocrypha that are not uh, in Hebrew scripture today. So, if we take these books then of the Septuagint, and there's a bunch more of those obviously than what there were uh, that made it into the Protestant and Jewish canons, um, there are still plenty more books that didn't make it into the 
Catholic canon, even though some of them were, most all of them were scripture for somebody at some point. Uh, whether or not it was ever very many people, some people, somebody thought it was scripture, uh, at least the original author and the immediate uh, community that would have been around that author, and then whoever wanted, whoever bothered to copy it. So that if you can imagine the ones that we actually have that survive, <laughs> It's because it was important enough that somebody actually bothered to do something very expensive of hand copying a thing by hand, and it actually has uh, been copied enough times that it's come down to us. Uh, there's plenty more of these that are lost than what, that what we have that are, that are written and saved. Anyway, so these are two volumes of Old Testament pseudepigrapha, of which I have one of these here. So uh, there's the canon, then there's the deuterocanon or apocrypha, and finally pseudepigrapha. Uh, the word pseudepigrapha means falsely attributed because in, in general the books are written by people who clearly didn't write them or they're attributed to people who, was not, who were not the authors, right? Chapter 4 And again observe ye the days of summer, how the sun is above the earth over against it, and you seek shade and shelter by reason of the heat of the sun, and the earth also burns with growing heat and so you cannot tread on the earth, or on a rock, by reason of its heat. Chapter 5 Observe ye how the trees cover themselves with green leaves and bear fruit. Wherefore, give ye heed and know with regard to all his works, and recognize how he that liveth for ever hath made them so. And all his works go on thus from year to year for ever, and all the tasks which they accomplish for him, and their tasks change not, but according as God hath ordained, so is it done. And behold how the sea and the rivers in like manner accomplish and change not their tasks from his commandments. But ye, ye have not been steadfast, nor done the commandments of the Lord, but ye have turned away and spoken proud and hard words with your impure mouths against his greatness. O oh, ye hard-hearted, ye shall find no peace. Therefore shall ye execrate your days, and the years of your life shall perish, and the years of your destruction shall be multiplied in eternal execration, and ye shall find no mercy. That same term though then, pseudepigraphic, um, actually applies to lots and lots of books that actually made it in the canon, much less the Apocrypha as well, right? So for example, the book of Daniel, Daniel which we mentioned is the last of the um, books in the Hebrew Bible to have been written, and it's even written partially in Aramaic, uh, made it into the canon uh, even though it's technically pseudepigraphical. So in other words, it's not written by Daniel. So among the pseudepigrapha, <laughs> pseudepigrapha, um, there's a whole bunch of them. These are ones that are just in my, my couple volumes here, right? But there's a bunch more even in the volume. So there are things like the Apocalypse of Abraham, the Apocalypse of Adam, the Testament of Adam, the Life of Adam and Eve, the Book of Jubilees, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Testament of the Three Patriarchs, the Testament of Job, the Book of Enoch, which we're going to be talking about, and then the second, third, and fourth books of Enoch. <laughs> so additional books of Enoch that people have written. So you can kind of see here a trend. There's a lot of a, apocalypse. And so one of the things, that's one of the things that's going to come through. So all of these books are coming from that later time period when Daniel is composed, the Book of Daniel. And the Book of Daniel is one of the few apocalyptic books uh, in the uh, Hebrew Bible. And so this is a period um, when uh, second, of Second Temple Judaism when apocalyptic thinking has really come to the front and there are lots and lots of these books that have been made. And so the fact that, um, that these, let's say, have been in the Christian canon has met and have been rejected then late from the later rabbinic canon um, has kept, meant that apocalypticism has stayed more with Christianity than with Judaism, which largely moved on, right? Okay, so this is also at the Dead Sea Scroll location. So at Qumran, this place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, the Essene um, complex, uh, among those were also fragments of the Book of Jubilees and the Book of Enoch. So even though, again, this isn't, making, this isn't part of the Septuagint and it's not part of the canons of uh, the Catholics or the Orthodox, they were part of uh, the scripture used by the Essenes in the Dead Sea Scroll community. Uh, also, very widely, the Book of Enoch was very widely used by early Christians. So, for example, the New Testament author 
of the book of Jude, the epistle of Jude, quotes from the book of Enoch, even though it's not in the Old Testament as far as the Christians are concerned. So here's the quote in Jude. See, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict everyone of all the deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so that quotation then uh, is the letter, Epistle of Jude, uh, chapter, you know, it's only one chapter long anyway, verses 14 and 15, uh, quoting First Enoch, or the book of Enoch here, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. And you can kind of see again, apocalypticism, right? So end times. Um, however, uh, by the time we get to the fourth century, by the time uh, Christianity becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire, when uh, they're getting down to business and formulating everything, making creeds, and also deciding on the canon, uh, that's the time period when it started to be fall out of favor. And so specifically, um, uh, both Augustine and Jerome, who tended to not agree on many, many things at all, both agreed that Enoch didn't, uh, didn't make the grade. So uh, the part of the problem here is, is that the book contain, can, contains stuff that uh, mark it out to be written you know, much, much later uh, than, the, than when Enoch would have been alive. So Enoch, uh, as a um, person who is living the seventh generation from, from Adam, uh, this would essentially be the oldest, by far and away, the oldest book in the Bible, if it did make it into the Bible. Uh, because uh, the rest of the, the Bible, as it's now understood, um, as far as Augustine and Jerome were concerned, Moses was the author of the, of the Pentateuch. That's, that also proves not to be the case now. In other words, so it was, uh, those texts actually are written many, many you know, generations after when Moses would have lived. But Enoch is so much further back that this book would have been you know, incredibly ancient. And so they don't find that credible. So they just don't think it was written by Enoch. So they, don't, they question it as being authoritative. It's not as much, I don't think it's as much the content that they're, that they're as worried about. Um, uh, the content is, in fact, um, one of the things that the real Christians really liked about it. And so, they, and so anyway, so since they both didn't um, think that Enoch should be considered part of the canon, and Jerome was the person that was preparing the great Latin translation uh, of the text, uh, it ultimately did not, and Augustine was preparing the canon list, uh, it ultimately didn't make it into the canon. Meanwhile, um, what ends up happening is there's places outside of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire, uh, this is in the African part of the Roman Empire, so there's Egypt, right? And Jerusalem, the Arabian Peninsula, the Red Sea. Uh, the, the Romans um, have trade with India, and that trade is coming down from, through Egypt, and uh, also through Petra, which is a wonderful place in Jordan with all the rock palaces and everything. So the, um, uh, on the trade routes, there is this kingdom called Aksum. Uh, and so that's along the route, right? And so uh, in the Ethiopian kingdom of Aksum, so this is where Ethiopia is now, and it's also a precursor of Ethiopia, um, it grew kind of from in this first 10 centuries of the Christian era, uh, originally, the people there are, like everybody else, they're pagans, polytheists. Uh, but the kingdom apparently, uh, there's indications, was heavily influenced by Judaism. So there has been Jewish spread ever since um, the at first exile in Egypt. And so that has come down to that. And at some point, anyway, then, anyway, one of the kings in the fourth century, at the same time as Constantine, the emperor Constantine, converted and became and started the process of Christianizing the Roman Empire. Uh, king Azana II converted to Christianity in Aksum and made the state religion. So here. So King Azana here, uh, his, he has a tutor named Frumentius. That guy is from Syria. He's a Phoenician or a Syrio-Phoenician. Um, and he uh, later then becomes, when he converts the king, he becomes the first bishop of Aksum. So they start setting up a Christian church there centered around a bishop. Uh, the kingdom adopts Christianity as its state religion in 328. Aksum then is the very first state to use the symbol of the cross on its coinage. So already in the fourth century, there's a coin with the cross. Um, and so if we kind of have this early, this is an early, this is kind of a, 
early but accelerating to the modern divisions of Christianity. So anyway, this is kind of Europe, Africa, Asia. And so we have the, the split that we're pretty aware of between the Latin West, so the Catholic West, and the Orthodox, Greek Orthodox East that extends up into Russia. So Russia's part of the Greek Orthodox tradition. And then North-South division here between the Protestants and Catholics, but are all part of kind of the Latin West. Then further east, so beyond what's now Turkey, uh, in Syria, in Iraq, and then beyond the Persian Empire and into India, and then down here in Egypt and down into Ethiopia, there's the churches of the, um, the Oriental Orthodox churches and the churches of the East, which even though it sounds a lot like Eastern Orthodox, is not Eastern Orthodox, it's more Eastern. So beyond the Eastern Orthodox, you know, when you start saying that the West is here, then there's actually a lot of East. You know, the Orient is very, there's more and more Orient, right? You just have to keep saying East, East, East. Okay, so of these divisions then, Protestant, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, we're talking about then Orth Oriental Orthodoxy and the churches of the East. Um, they're already divided uh, from the churches of the West, including the Eastern Orthodox, so the Greek Orthodox churches, over Christology. In the first couple centuries of these lost Christianities, people have very different answers to the question. Um, we're monotheists, so we think Jesus is God, but we're only, well, there's only one God, and Jesus is praying to God, so how does this kind of, how does this all work, right? And so the ultimate formula that comes in the Council of Nicaea that Constantine calls in the Roman Empire is, you know, that the Father or Creator is God, that Christ is God, that this Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not Christ, Christ is not the Father, right? So essentially the idea is one God, but three persons. And it's very, very complicated and pretty much very few Christians get it. Okay, but let's say, so but for the philosophy, ph philosophically minded, which uh, ancient Greeks were, um, then there's a next question. Okay, yeah, now we have this idea that Jesus is God, but he was also a human. <laughs> So how, what does that mean then? Does he have a, a nature where uh, he, his real nature is that he's divine and that was always his nature even though he's in human uh, form during his earthly ministry? And that's what the churches of the East, so the Nestorians say, his nature is that he's God, but he looked like a human uh, and acted like a human when he's in. When he's in uh, or does he have two equally balanced natures so is he both have a divine nature, a fully divine nature, and a fully human nature? So that's diophysitism. Or does he have one nature only, this Christ nature, which is both human and divine? And so what's the answer for all Protestants, Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox? It's the middle one. But essentially, especially nobody in the West ever got it. So the special quality of the of Jesus is that he's begotten, the special quality of the Spirit is that he proceeds, and the special quality of the Father is that he's creator, right? In, so in the Gospel of John, the formula works like this. In the beginning was the Logos, in the beginning was the, you know, which is sometimes translated as the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what it's saying is that when it's with God, it's with the Creator, so in other words, his Word was with the Father, the Creator, uh, but the word also is God in the same way that the creator is God. So the idea of it here then is, is that Protestants, Catholics, and the Eastern Orthodox agree in uh, that the way where this thing works is diophysitism, which is to say Jesus is fully human, fully divine, possessing divine nature and human nature in harmony. So that's how they work it out. Not so according to the Oriental Orthodox and the churches of the East, so the Oriental Orthodox are Jesus has one nature that is human and divine. It's not seem like that's too much different, but it, <laughs> it's enough for them to split apart. And same thing, the divine nature overwhelms the human nature. So that's Nestorianism. So that's this kind of Syrian and uh, Chaldean churches, the churches that go off into India and, and the Mongol Empire. And this is the churches in Egypt and then down into Ethiopia. What ends up happening then is uh, uh, in the seventh and eighth centuries, Islam emerges out of the Arabian Peninsula and conquers uh, the whole Persian Empire and then also uh, the portions of the East Roman Empire that are not uh, in union with Constantinople. So these guys, in fact, are being persecuted like crazy by, the, uh, by their Roman or Byzantine leaders. 
uh, for their kind of heres their views of Christianity are seemed to, deemed as heretical. The Muslims are very happy. They're like, we don't care what you. What's the difference between what you're saying? <laughs> you know, you're all not believing the correct way anyway, because there's only one God. There's not three gods. So anyway, what ends up happening then is there's this Latin West and the Greek East, and they're quite cut off then, right, from this Christian Ethiopian kingdom. So uh, the Oriental Orthodox churches. So this is essentially. Ethiopian church, the Eritrean church, and then the Coptic church, which exists under Egyptian rule. So maybe 10% of the Egyptian population now has continued to be Christian uh, to this day, I mean. So the Ethiopian Orthodox church uh, develops on its own traditions, and these are some pretty cool traditions. Uh, for example, they have these, uh, there's maybe 100 different, this is one of the nicest ones, but anyway, 100 different monolithic churches, which are carved out of like one rock. So you can kind of see the rock all around here that's been carved away. This is not like built out of rocks. This is just one rock. So from the 13th century, so from the Middle Ages onward, the king of Ethiopia uh, claimed descent from a guy, a traditional guy or um, legendary figure called Menelik I, uh, who is said to have been then the son of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And so the Queen of Sheba is her, in turn a legendary character in the, from the Book of Kings in the Old Testament. And so the idea is, according to the Ethiopian tradition, is, is that they had a tryst, as Solomon was wont to do, especially towards the end when he had a hundred pagan wives and all this kind of thing. Uh, and so then the Queen of Sheba uh, went back to Sheba, which is uh, across the Red Sea from Aksum, uh, and essentially, uh, you know, which is to say Yemen. And the Aksumite kingdom included Yemen at a certain point. And so they actually you know, included both sides of the Red Sea. And they more or less say Queen of Sheba comes back and her child is um, the, the ultimate um, legendary heir or founder or whatever of the dynasty that becomes the Ethiopian di royal dynasty. Okay, another thing they got. So this is Aksum, the city of Aksum in Ethiopia. Uh, this is a part of the the central church, the cathedral of Our Lady Mary of Zion. Uh, then there's a little chapel here. That's the chapel of the tablet. That's a chapel that nobody's allowed to go to, into except for the top Ethiopian uh, clergy because inside there is kept, according to the Ethiopian church, the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, and then of course they have their own Bible. So they're cut off. They're not part of these debates that are happening in the Latin West with Augustine and Jerome about what should be in the Bible and what shouldn't. And so it, they have the same Bible, uh, all the books that were in the Septuagint. So in other words, the same as the Greek Orthodox and also the um, uh, Catholics. But they also then have five additional books, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, and three Ethiopian books of Maccabees, which are different from the, Ethi the other books of Maccabees um, that exist in the Apocrypha. Okay, so to actually get to the topic of Enoch, who was Enoch? Um, uh, Enoch is one of the legendary figures from the, what I call the begets section of Genesis. <laughs> so so-and-so begets so-and-so begets so-and-so. And so he's included in the lineage from Adam to Noah, uh, which is to say after the Cain and Abel story and before the flood story. And so he's listed as the seventh from Adam and is the great grandfather of Noah. So if we're going to do a, one of the genealogy chart used, you know, from those begets, Adam and Eve, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalil, Jared, uh, Enoch is right here, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, and then Noah's three sons, Hem, Sham, and Japheth. So I will just read, this is what the begets sound like. So this is Genesis 5, 18 and 20. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. Jared lived after the birth of Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. <laughs> and so almost all of the begets go like that. So the formula for every one of these guys, we don't know anything more about them almost than that. And we'll have a formula, the, the number of years is different for each one of them, but more or less that's how they all go. Except for this one. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years, so much less. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him.
That's all we got. Uh, but that all by itself, you can imagine, in a whole list of begats where everybody's living all these thousand years long, and yet we don't have any details of their lives at all until suddenly, boom, you know, here we have a uh, guy who lives only a much shorter time, he walks with God, and then he's no more because God took him. So that uh, has inspired a lot of, let's say, speculation and ultimately fan fiction. So the Book of Enoch as we have it, is divided into five sections or books. And these probably are originally different texts. So probably what's happened is that there's an editor who has put together a bunch of Enoch material. Uh, and then in some cases, maybe we're putting some of the Enoch material together and maybe expanded it to make another portion of the book. So what we have are called the Book of Watchers, the Book of Similitudes or Parables, the Book of Astronomical Writings, the Book of Dream Vision, and the Book of the Epistle of Enoch. And these are different, you know, kind of in order, the different chapters. Um, and the oldest parts here, may be written as early as the 4th or 3rd century BC, and so that's like the Book of Washers and this Book of Astronomical Writings. And then the more recent stuff then uh, would have been right in the 1st century, let's say, or in the, Ma in the later Maccabean period. And so again, there are prophecies about the Maccabean Revolt that are very, very specific, just like happens in Daniel. And that's why we can date Daniel so, cl so clearly, because it, it tracks, the book of Daniel tracks everything that happens exactly in the Maccabean history all the way up until one, a particular moment, and then it goes wildly wrong. <laughs> so it gets the next part completely wrong. It makes very specific errors very immediately after, and so we can date Daniel very clearly to when it was written, right? right up to here. <laughs> After that it wasn't written and then it was wrong. <laughs> you know? So essentially that's how we date Daniel. Likewise here we can do that with Enoch which is written parts of it anyway. This book of uh, the dream vision is predict making similar kinds of apocalyptic traditions. I'm sorry, apocalyptic predictions just like are in the book of Daniel. Okay, so we want to look at a couple little portions of the text. Um, and so one of the things that I first was always drawn to, there's an expansion of this um, flood story. So one of the few stories that exists in Genesis about the time period before Noah. Uh, and so there is an explanation in Genesis that's kind of brief. And again, we don't really understand what it's about. Um, and th that kind of begs for an expansion. There's a vast expansion of that in the book of Enoch that explains what's going on. Chapter 6. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heaven, saw and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. And Semjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath, and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together, and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And there were in all two hundred who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called it Mount Hermon because they'd sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And these are the names of their leaders. Semiazaz, their leader, Arikaba, Ramael, Kokabiel, Tamiel, Ramiel, Danel, Ezekiel, Barakijal, Asael, Amaros, Baterel, Ananel, Zakiel, Samsapiel, Saterel, Turel, Jomjael, Sariel. These are their chiefs of tens. Chapter 7 And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, each chose for himself one, and they began to go in unto them and defile themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments in the cutting of roots, and made them acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant, and they bare great giants, whose height was three thousand ells, who consumed the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish, 
and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. Chapter 8 And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates, and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them, and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all colouring tinctures. And there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways. Semjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings, Amaros the resolving of enchantments, Barakijal taught astrology, Kokobel the constellations, Ezekiel the knowledge of the clouds, Arachiel the signs of the earth, Shamsiel the signs of the sun, and Sariel the course of the moon. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. Chapter 9 And then Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel looked down from heaven and saw much blood being shed upon the earth, and all lawlessness being wrought upon the earth. And they said one to another, The earth, made without inhabitant, cries the voice of their crying up to the gates of heaven. And now to you, the holy ones of heaven, the souls of men make their suit, saying, Bring our cause before the Most High. And they said to the Lord of the ages, Lord of lords, God of gods, King of kings, and God of the ages, the throne of thy glory standeth unto all the generations of the ages, and thy name holy and glorious and blessed unto all ages. Thou hast made all things, and power over all things hast thou and all things are naked and open in thy sight, and thou seest all things, and nothing can hide itself from thee. Thou seest what Azazel hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth, and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn, and Semjaza, to whom thou hast given authority, to bear rule over his associates. And they have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth, and have slept with the women, and have defiled themselves, and revealed to them all kinds of sins. And the women have borne giants, and the whole earth has thereby been filled with blood and unrighteousness. And so this is the origin, for example, in the, in the Genesis story of, you know, the like, people like Goliath, right? So giants in the earth. So God sends then... Um, the archangel Uriel to warn Noah and his family of the coming flood, and he sends Michael and the other archangels to go after these fallen angels to bind them, right, and cast them into the pit. And so, anyway, so this is a big expansion of a couple verses in Genesis. So one of the things that this gives us, though, you know, is this angelology and actually these names of the four archangels. So this is a, um, a Christian church that has Michael, Gabriel, I'm sorry, Michael, it's in the order here. Uriel, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, right? And so there, there they are in, in, the, in the stained glass. Um, and so this is, becomes a very important source for angelology, the Book of Enoch. So for these archangels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel, only make, they only make it into the um, Hebrew Bible, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, in the Book of Daniel here. And then Raphael is in the Book of Tobit, which is actually one of the future canonical books, so the Apocrypha. So it isn't actually in the Tanakh, right? Uh, and so Daniel, again, you can see this is, again, this, one of this, this late book, uh, the related book, a book where they have these kind of apocryphal, uh, or rather apocalyptic concerns. This is also at, really on the minds of the Christians, and so uh, Michael and Gabriel have pretty important roles in, in the Christian New Testament. So this also then becomes as people kind of created this kind of uh, angels of the four corners of the earth, uh, the, of the four elements, air, earth, fire, and water, of the cardinal directions of time and everything like that, then they associate, um, you know, again, the angels with those different points in, in various kinds of mysticism and also magic practices and other things like that. Uh, it's also then a source of this demonology, right? So we have all these names of demons. So 
Behold the names of those fallen angels, and these are their names. The first of them is Samjaza, the second is Artequifa, the third is Armen, the fourth is Kokobel, you know, and so on and so forth. So we have lots and lots of names of devils that also then get mined for um, black magic, right, and sorcery and things like that. Uh, and part of the ideas of even the um, uh, later mythologies of, 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 and elaborations of the stories of hell and things. Chapter 69 And the third was named Gadriel. He it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death. And he led astray Eve, and showed the weapons of death to the sons of men, the shield, and the coat of mail, and the sword for battle, and all the weapons of death to the children of men. And from his hand they have proceeded against those who dwell on the earth from that day and for evermore. And the fourth was named Penemue. He taught the children of men the bitter and the sweet, and he taught them all the secrets of their wisdom. And he instructed mankind in writing with ink and paper, and thereby many sinned from eternity to eternity and until this day. For men were not created for such a purpose, to give confirmation to their good faith with pen and ink. It's also, uh, and one of the reasons why it was so important to early Christians, it's also a big source of uh, uh, messianism. And this was also why they liked it at Qumran. So the Dead Sea Scrolls people are very much uh, people on the outs with the uh, contemporary authorities in Jerusalem. They've been kicked out of of being able to be the priests in Jerusalem, and they looking forward to a day when they and their interpretation and their calendar and every other, one of these kind of ideas about purity, uh, when a, a, a massive apocalyptic event will occur and they will be the righteous ones that are going to be restored in a new Jerusalem and a new temple, uh, messianic figures that are coming with that. Chapter 46 And there I saw one who had a head of days, and his head was white like wool. And with him was another being, whose countenance had the appearance of a man, and his face was full of graciousness, like one of the holy angels. And I asked the angel who went with me, and showed me all the hidden things, concerning that son of man, who he was, and whence he was, and why he went with the head of days. And he answered and said unto me, This is the son of man, who hath righteousness, with whom dwelleth righteousness, and who revealeth all the treasures of that which is hidden, because the Lord of spirits hath chosen him, and whose lot hath the preeminence before the Lord of spirits, in uprightness for ever. Chapter 51 And in those days shall the earth also give back that which has been entrusted to it, and Sheol also shall give back that which it has received, and hell shall give back that which it owes. For in those days the elect one shall arise, and he shall choose the righteous and holy from among them, for the day has drawn nigh that they should be saved. And the elect one shall in those days sit on my throne, and his mouth shall pour forth all the secrets of wisdom and counsel. For the Lord of spirits hath given them to him, and hath glorified him." You know, uh, why this you know, was something that early Christians kind of read and looked forward to, and they saw in terms of their understanding of, of, of Jesus as, as the Messiah, or as the Greek version for that is Christ, um, why they're kind of then seeing, you know, in the, the title um, in the Gospels, Jesus frequently uses then is, uh, calls himself by the title Son of Man, right? The Son of Man says this and that. Um, anyway, and this idea of, again, an apocalyptic future, uh, and that's about the salvation and the, where the righteous are vindicated. There's actually an amazing amount to this book. It's a very um, it's a substantial, it's a long book, and it's had a very long reach. So it has affected, even though it didn't make it into the canon, uh, in the Christian West, it actually has um, uh, ended up um, influencing our ideas about angels and demons, and it also influenced, uh, it was also very characteristic of Second Temple Jewish thought, at least among the apocalyptic groups, uh, out of which Christianity emerged. 
And so when we go back and we look at these things, we can kind of see Christianity wasn't such a bizarre thing. How did this thing come out of the root? It's actually, there is this stream that exists. Um, obviously, uh, the rabbinic, proto-rabbinic part is also there too. And the, there's already this division that happens between the two religions even before, uh, even before the canons are formed.